Hi, I'm Ashley Elsner. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Artery Pay. We are a digital payments company that unifies compliance with transaction so that banks are very easily able to run their cannabis programs. It's practically a turnkey compliance program um, that is actually run off of technology with, um, with uh, multiple lines of tracking and, uh, and transaction reporting. So that's what we do. Allison. Cool. Uh, I'm Allison Koff. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Artemis. We are a software provider for the cannabis industry, and our core product is a cultivation management platform. Helps automate all the people, plants, processes, and compliance that you've got going on, specifically built for cultivators. Uh, so we're not doing POS, we're not doing all those other things, but we built it in an integratable way so you can tie into whatever systems you choose to use. And, and actually, I asked each one to say where you're based. Oh, sorry. San Jose, um, and we... We actually have operations in California, Massachusetts, Nevada, and Washington. For your finance thing, what about you with your, your stuff? Your My stuff. Yeah. yeah. You're growing stuff. <laughs> we're growing stuff. Uh, we're based in Brooklyn, New York, uh, but we also have offices around the country as well as North America, and we're global, so we're in Europe as well and Australia. Well, I guess if you have operating clients, can you, like she said, the states where people are using her software, sure. where are people using your software? Uh, almost every state that's legal, yeah. And we're also, we have a, we came from the non-cannabis space first, so we had been selling tra 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 more traditional operations. Um, and so we've got, oh, I think, every state on the non-cannabis side and every legal state on the cannabis side. I'm Michael Pavlak. I'm out of Detroit, Michigan, and we focus on um, seed to sale compliance software. I'm with Stash Stock is the company name. Uh, we really focus on the RFID aspect in the metric states making a no-touch solution where you don't have to touch your plants while you're moving them, and having real-time visibility into all of your cultivation and processing uh, concerns. And uh, I was a grower for eight years before this and have 15 years of technology background. So trying to bridge my experience from cultivation into technology and providing that to licensed uh, growers. Amazing. Uh, I'm Joel Sherlock, Vancouver-based, I think. Spend a, a, a 250 days on the road. We uh, have a manufacturing business, one of the leading manufacturers of the extraction machines that power a lot of these great people making oil products. So we make CO2 and ethanol, ethanol equipment. Um, and much like a lot of people on the stage with me, we are global in four continents and offices on three. Great, and I'll give you some context on me. My name's Justin Hall. My ticket to this party is that I registered bud.com 26 years ago, and I know my way around a web browser, so I've, I'm the CTO of bud.com. We do e-commerce for cannabis and hemp uh, pre-rolls and for CBD wellness products. We serve California with our cannabis uh, THC products, and then we ship around the world. People like stuff like weed. So. Um, uh, I think what's really interesting is that if you look at each of you, you would have different visibility into the cannabis industry. You would have visibility into payment streams. You would have, you two would have visibility into growth, uh, growth trends, and you would have visibility into how people are extracting cannabis and, and where people, uh, there's demand for your software, there's, there's the growth of the industry. So I wonder if one of you wants to wade in and, and, and take what I just said as a prompt to promote the thing that you're working on. Because that's what panels are. So bring it on. Sure. Um, so what Artery Pay does is actually offers a completely legal payment solution. Um, my background is actually financial institution law and operations, um, and that's financial institution operations, so how the sausage is in fact made, the back office stuff. Um, and one of the things that we were able to do, um, actually because of my background, is to build the uh, MRB FinCEN compliance requirements, and I'm going to tell what those acronyms are because we talked about this right before. Um, so MRB means marijuana business, and that is a, class of, a regulatory classification um, by the financial crimes enforcement um, part of the Treasury Department with the federal government. Um, everybody is required to follow these regulations if they want to um, work with the cannabis industry, but it can be pretty cumbersome for banks to actually be able to engage with the space based on this the added cost. And so we built it into the transaction system to make sure that that cost was not the reason why a bank that was interested in working with the cannabis space uh, could not work with it. Um, it is not a legal issue, in fact. Um, it is very much a cost-benefit analysis that they go through. 
And so we bring that cost down to a very, very low, reasonable rate for them and make training much more efficient, much easier, and provide a platform to them that allows us to actually access the financial systems openly and with these partners rather than you know, trying to sneak in or saying that it's a workaround. You don't have workarounds in finance. That is absolutely, it, you're basically between cannabis and finance, you have one highly regulated industry and another highly regulated industry and you're just piling regulations on top of each other and the interplay of those things end up causing a lot of complications and that's really what's causing the issues around lack of access. And so we are bringing in new banks, we are onboarding them all the time um, and we are able to provide them with the systems that make it possible for us to provide you with completely legal, completely transparent payments on a digital platform. So also highly integratable, where we are agnostic as to, um, as to other softwares that you would be using. So it's very easy to use. Your customers can download the app and actually go in and pay you in store. Very, very simple. And it works multi-channel. So online, on the go, in store, doesn't matter where you are, you can use this. Okay, so that's, so y and you would have visibility into the financial growth yes. and so can you pluck something off the top of your head that's interesting that you've seen about the financial patterns of the cannabis industry using artery? Uh, sure, um, so um, dispensaries are still primarily using cash or in some places they are unfortunately using things that they're not actually allowed to use, um, they probably don't know that. Um, credit cards is illegal for this industry, period, stop, halt, like in, in the United States. Now, there's a, these are all United States specific issues because the financial regulations are United States specific. So um, from our perspective, you're seeing a lot of, you're seeing a lot of people who maybe don't have the background coming into the space and selling products that they're not allowed to sell into this space. Um, so really having someone with an operating background in finance is, is kind of critically important to making sure that you don't have that sort of problem. Um, and of course, when that happens, uh, we see a lot of bank shutdowns. We see, I, I think almost everybody who's in the cannabis space has experienced something where they've ended up, um, through no fault of their own, um, having their bank accounts revoked. And so we see a lot of that. Okay, that sounds Sorry. like accurate data. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sure, I mean, like Michael, I was also on uh, the growing side before this and, and worked as an operator. And so uh, the thing that I think I'm most passionate about in this space is solving the issues around technology scale and usability and how do you get people to actually love using technology, which isn't as easy as it sounds. Um, this is new technology, it's got a lot of issues. We've got security issues, we've got scaling issues, you've got uh, offline access issues where you have remote areas for hemp specifically, uh, in particular where you've got a lot of field uh, accessibility issues, you've got uh, a large migrant population working in the fields when you're talking about outdoor, you're talking about farm workers who move from one facility to another often, so you've got traceability issues and lack of transparency when data leaves one facility because you have workers leaving, you've got illiteracy issues amongst workers, you've got language barriers, you've got these this slew of challenges that make solving technology issues in this space really, really interesting uh, and really hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so the approach that we took as a technology company was, what can we solve for growers that I knew to be a major issue because it was something I would have paid for uh, as an operator, but also starting with the things that are sticky enough that get you into a system until you love it, and then layer on the things that you really, really need sort of thereafter, right? And so instead of starting from uh, maybe the, the regulation side where a lot of the other companies started where they said, hey, here, here's a huge business opportunity, right? We can build regulated, uh, regulatory software, we can link in, we can trace, we can get governments to the point where they can track products so that they can tax against it, which is fine, great business opportunity. Um, we said, well, you know, what you're doing there though is you're creating regulatory software, you're not creating grower's software. Um, and so we said, you know, you gotta build software that people can use on a day-to-day -day basis um, so start with tracking plants in a way that is a production value to me. So give me crop scheduling, give me estimates on yield, give me how many workers I'm gonna need today, tomorrow, next week, six months from now. Give me the ability to do purchase orders but not from a regulatory standpoint, give it to me from a forecasting standpoint so I know if I'm running low on something, I'm not gonna run out of it. 
and I can actually send that with a one click to my vendors. Or on the sales side, instead of saying, I want a POS just so that I can track it, again, from a financial or regulatory standpoint, give it to me so that I can do sales orders so I can forecast and see sell-through rates of my products and start to adjust my um, production schedules based off what's actually selling in the market. Those types of insights that, to me, make me or cost me a lot of money. And we started there and we started layering on top of that so that we could be in all the metric states, right? Have a seamless metric integration, try and replace the experience with bad things that people don't like doing with good things that they really love doing because it's a tool for me and my operation. Okay, that sounds like a great tool. So uh, any data nuggets that you would pluck from your tool rollout? Data nuggets. Uh, <laughs> lots or of observations data. across the data landscape? Yeah, I think the, the tip I always give, I'll, I'll give this because I've seen it a lot, a lot of times, is that when you're evaluating things, think about the things that you can replace pen and paper first um, because they're things that you know that you have to do because you're doing them on a day-by-day -day basis. So if you look at your, around your facility and you're like, oh yeah, I'm recording pH uh, on my, and I have got a log on my wall. Can you put that in a software system or can you look at those things first? Because the more things you can replace that are very manual, um, one, you're just gonna immediately have an ROI and two, it's gonna be tracing that information so that if Joe, who's tracking pH, leaves, you actually have a system and you know what the pH was three weeks ago. Um, so like those types of things, I think the, the number one mistake we make all the time is when we're evaluating technology, we get sucked into what features are cool, what the newest thing is. I wanna have AI and everything, right? Like all these things that are sexy in technology, um, but the reality is the thing you're gonna use every day replaces something that you're already doing. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, you know what Allison is saying is the same for us, um, but one of the things that we really look at is scale. So as a company, let's say we deal with someone who can grow 10,000 plants, but they want to get familiar with it first, so they're going to start with 500, and they're very successful at 500. Now they go up to a 2,000. At 2,000 now they're struggling. Why does that happen? They don't have a technology in place. They don't have something that's going to make that economy of scale of compliance and drive that cost down. So right now a lot of operators actually as you scale your cost is going up around compliance because you have more people. You have to train these people. The first person maybe does a really good job. The second person maybe does a decent job. Third, fourth, fifth person you're training. It's just more and more effort to make sure that they're doing that same good job. How can we bring a technology in and say that one person can do the whole scale or two people can manage it instead of five or ten. Uh, so that's one of the things we really focus on is a scalability of cultivators to not have a burden of manual effort around compliance, utilize the technology to automatically capture and record things accurately, quickly. You don't have to hire these people. And then using technology, you're not interacting with your plants as much, your contamination risk is going down, so you're getting a, a bigger yield at the end because you're not having to waste as much stuff, right? So th those are the things that we're looking at in, in terms of technology and, again, replacing some of these manual process so that that time just goes away. And, and you people are using your software, oh, hallelujah. Yeah. They're saving time, and what what have you gleaned from watching the way people use your software? Uh, one of the things that, that we struggle with is operators that have been doing it manually and they look at the technology, instantly it resonates. They're like, oh my God, you're gonna save me all this effort? But when we talk to startups or facilities that are just getting rolling, they believe they're not gonna make any mistakes and they believe that the process in place is gonna be followed perfectly by every employee and inevitably it's not. And uh, we see a lot of times people will call us like, oh my God, I moved 500 plants and I'd lost three of them or whatever. It took me 20 hours to track those three down. Well, using the technology, we can find those plants in about five minutes. So you're talking about hours of effort versus minutes on, on mistakes and people don't wanna talk about mistakes. They happen all the freaking time, and you have to account for it, and how are you gonna mitigate those risks? Because one mistake can cost you tons of man hours if you don't have a good process in place. The one, the token hardware guy. T token <laughs> hardware guy, exactly. Well, I, I think a lot of people look at, at data and technology kind of, you know, as, as 
okay, can speed things up, it might be able to save me some time, but a lot of people miss the fact that I think one of the only guarantees we have in this industry is change, and it changes quickly. So that investment in data, you know, that investment in, in having those systems so that as you're changing, you have better data to go back on. I mean, we're, we're focused kind of after you guys have done your, all the great work and then product is dried, right, we're, we're focused on extracting it. But, you know, there's going to be change in a lot of the products that our clients would be making a year from now or just being thought of or dreamt up right now. So, you know, flexibility in that infrastructure, but ultimately it's led by the data. How do you grow more THCP or, you know, any CBG, CBN, whatever it is, like we can only extract up to 100% of what's grown, no more. <laughs> we haven't figured that part out yet. But, you know, it's, it's that side of, you know, going back to that data as the products change to figure out, okay, well, what did we do in that one grow run where we saw a spike in this thing that we're now looking for? Okay, you just ended your remarks there. I will say that I've chatted with this gentleman before. It was today, so the information's fresh. Uh, the company he's worked for has made many of these machines that extract cannabis oil that can be used then to make other products. So those, the, the machines that your company's made are distributed around the world into different countries. So, man, you gotta have some interesting data on how extraction's going over here versus over there or something. Well, I think, it, 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 yeah, I mean, we definitely see there's lots to be learned, right? And, and there's a ton of mistakes that have been made, but so many people are not open to really understanding. I mean, in, in the early days of the Canadian, you know, funded capacity, giant greenhouses, and then they were like, oh, we can't learn anything from the guys from California. It's like someone making half a million vape cartridges a month is going to have the same bottlenecks that you're going to have when Canada maybe one day gets to that point, hopefully. Um, you know, we're starting to see a lot of growth in big pharma companies stepping in in the EU ecosystem. It's all EU GMP, which is a pharma level. So it's significantly higher barrier to entry once you get past, like cultivation can be done in GACP, like uh, farming practices, but EU GMP or good manufacturing practices is extremely, you know, lots of documentation, track everything, each piece of equipment that touches the oil has to be, you know, you have to know where the steel came from, how do you clean it, like it's, it's really, really comprehensive. Um, so, you know, but they don't have cannabis experience at the level that we do. So, you know, I think ultimately you can, you can learn something from every single market and you can learn from other people's mistakes. Yes, and uh, mistakes, that's good. That's a segue to the next question, which is if you make mistakes, you poison people. If you guys make, uh, with your company, so if you guys make mistakes, people lose their crops or, or grow the wrong thing or may poison people too. If you screw up, people could be accused of money laundering and uh, go to jail. Uh, if I screw up, people get the, you know, get the wrong, get, get a hybrid instead of a sativa vape cart delivered to their house. So, um, <laughs> so let's talk uh, here, but if you guys are looking at what failure is, how does somebody evaluating your solution decide that you're trustworthy when the stakes are high? So you have to look at people's backgrounds. If you're not focused on people's backgrounds and you can't find out who's running a company or they say they're, um, in quotation marks, an ISO, which stands for um, Independent Sales Organization, um, you've got to know that anybody who is just sales uh, probably doesn't really know what's going on in the back um, and can't really explain what you're supposed to be doing and what you're not. And you know the best way to evaluate some vendors, and I hate to say this because uh, it sounds like I'm you know plugging lawyers, um, but get your corporate lawyers involved. Um, if anybody is going to be able to evaluate whether this is going to actually pass muster, they're going to be able to do so. Um, and you know it's a little bit tricky because from the financial services space, actually the best financial institution lawyers, they're all in New York City. I mean it just happens that that is like our core the core location. So if you have people who are coming from that kind of a background um, that really have, have been focused on the financial space in New York City, like that's really good credentials. That's really outstanding. Um, for you know, somebody who is coming in and is you know, a relationship manager, eh, they may or may not know what they're talking about. And so when it comes down to it, you really wanna dig into what they're doing. And if after you've signed a non-disclosure agreement with people, they're still not willing to tell you who the financial institutions are that are backing them um, and that are working with them, that's a huge red flag. 
Um, another huge red flag um, in this space, specific to specific to cannabis regulation, uh, financial regulation on that, um, is when someone is calling an MRB a CRB because they're trying to rebrand a regulatory category, and that is not kosher. That is not kosher at all. You have to wonder whether these people are actually focused on what's best for you, or if they're just, you know going ahead and, and selling you something that either you don't need or isn't sustainable. Um, and that's another focus. Like you really have to dig into this because you are heavily regulated and on the financial side, unfortunately mistakes are not forgiven. They're yeah, not I mean, forgiven. you're not only innovating tech, you're innovating finance. And if oh, you yeah. innovate finance too much, they kind of, you might go to jail. Oh yeah, yeah, if you do it wrong, you go to prison and so does everybody in the supply chain that's involved with you and so do your customers because actually, um, the racketeering statutes in the that are federal federal government um, racketeering statutes um, get everybody on quote conspiracy to money launder. So if you don't know how they work in the back, how they're actually getting something done, um, you got to get somebody who can dig in on that. Um, and listen, your lawyers can help. This, this is what they do. They do the research. That's their job is to research this stuff for you um, and give you counsel. And you know if they're working with you in cannabis. They're gonna have no problem with finance. I mean, it, it's it's not hard. It's not hard. Lawyers love cannabis. They do. They love it. They use it. They love you. You make a lot of good work for them, and it's fun, and good money for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I think I totally agree. I mean, like, you will feel when you're vetting companies. Uh, like, just make sure you vet the company well, but you feel it, right? And so, like. If you're looking at a software company, go to their website, look at their team, right? If they don't have software engineers on the team, they're not gonna, if it's an outsourced software engineering team, you're gonna have a hack or a break or a downage in four minutes. Like it just is gonna happen because if you're not building the, the team internally, like you have no control over that product. So make sure that the, if it's a software company, make sure they have software engineers on the team. If you wanna dig even further, go to LinkedIn, right? And see the background of those people. If they have three engineers and they're all recent bootcamp grads, like you're gonna have what happened to the shadow. Yeah, like it, it's just gonna happen, right? Like this is this is what happens if you don't have control over your internal team, uh, and like that's nothing against those guys. I feel bad that that was their first job, <laughs> uh, but it happens, right? Like if you're a young engineer, it's, it, those things are gonna happen. So um, make sure that it's an experienced team. Make sure that they have a CTO that actually has experience building companies. Um, you can vet that kind of thing. Uh, make sure you can see who backs them financially, right? Do they have money in the bank? Are they gonna be around longer than you are? Uh, that's very important. Uh, you wanna make sure that they're gonna be around. So even if it's venture backed, make sure that they have the right sort of structure behind it um, and that they disclose. Call their customers, get case studies, like call customers, do it. Uh, when you put an inbound phone call in, I, I, did, I tested this the other day with some of our competitors and I had fun with it. Uh, but like put an inbound request in, see how long it takes for them to respond to you. If it takes two and a half weeks and you still haven't heard anything, you know, like those are the types of things that make a good company in any industry, whether it's cannabis or not. Uh, and so do the, like vet the company a little bit and, and, and make sure that they're a good partner for you. Because at the end of the day in cannabis specifically, it's a tumultuous ride. The market is changing drastically. Regulation changes. The financial markets are changing. We have elections coming up. Who knows what'll happen, right? All of this stuff is really hard for us. In addition to the fact that you're trying to build a business, which is also really hard. Uh, and so make sure that you find a good partner that you gel with. Make sure they can speak the same language you can. You know your business better than that vendor will ever know it, but if they catch on, if they're interested, if, if their founders is, are coming out to your site to see what's going on because they're just curious, like that's probably gonna be a better partner for you than somebody who you can't get service access to at any point. I agree with everything that they're saying, um, but you know my company actually is a little bit uh, newer to the industry. Uh, but one of the things that we do, you know, we're always on site. Uh, you can contact us directly. Uh, we're technology background, so the entire team is all software all the time. Uh, and we partner with large scale technology providers that do some pretty massive uh, websites and technology deployments. Uh, but yeah, one of the things for us is like, a lot of our competitors are gonna install software and hardware in your facility that you're gonna have to manage and make sure it has proper security and you know that no one's able to get into that box versus you know everything is cloud for us. So we're managing on top of Azure. We have all of the built-in securities from a cloud provider. We don't have to worry <laughs> about 
you know, someone hacking your local computer that you put password as the password uh, and, and stuff like that. So, you know, how much are we taking off of your plate from a risk standpoint? Um, what technologies are we using? What is our background? Those are all great questions. Surprisingly, people ask us for referrals all the time, and I thought that was strange at first, um, but I love when people ask me that because I can give them our clients that have moved off of other technologies, and I can say, you know, who are you evaluating right now? I might have someone that actually was a customer and switched, and they can talk to you about the experience, and we'll just connect you directly. Like, it's not like I'm speaking on their behalf. Call them, talk to them directly, get a few of them, and see what they have to say. We, you know, that's really the best way. I think a lot of people get sucked into contracts before they're actually ready for them. That's the other thing I would say is, be flexible, don't get into bed with anyone too soon. Uh, we have free offers, so you can use all of our technology for free for f uh, an entire growth cycle, so you can evaluate it locally, see if it actually makes sense for you before you pay anything, so. You know, we touched on a lot of the big things, people, testimonials, you know, I think data for sure, like there are a lot of big claims and, and maybe some unproven claims in the Canvas market. So just get people to back it up. You know, I mean, oh, that's, that's a big claim, show me. You know, there, there's a lot of data available too. I mean, there's multi-state operators who have multiple locations. You know, if, um, you know, if somebody buys in, in our world, right, if, if the best thing that someone could do for us is, you know, once they were on another platform, they come over to a Vitalis extraction machine and then every expansion going forward, that person's putting in more equipment, right? I mean, that's an investment in, in this partnership you know, um, but, but look at who are they working with and are those people continuing to work with them? You know, that's, that's usually a very strong endorsement, but you know, get those testimonials, talk to their customers, figure out where they're good, how's their service team, because things change, problems come up, things break, and, and you want somebody who's gonna be there to, uh, to support you. Speaking hardware of- Hardware is easy too, because you can just go look at it. Like that's a nice thing, like go look at the hardware. Touch it. Yeah, touch it, see it. <laughs> um, so, uh, speaking of someone there to support you, let's find a question in the audience. Let's hear it once again from the panel. Oh. Okay, all right. Does anyone have any questions? Any somebody, questions? somebody has a question. Someone's got to have one question. No? How Lori, do I get onto the internet? What's the Wi Fi password? No, no tech did questions. We cover yeah, it tech all? panel. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Lori. Can, can you turn it could off? You, and turn it back could on? you introduce yourself and say what you're working on? Hi guys, I'm Lori. I'm working on a new packaging startup. It's called Inkbright. Um, and we're working on a platform to help people create compliant packaging in a safe and sane way. Um, and I have to say, so far it's been a little bit of a struggle to attract tech candidates. Here in the Bay Area, it's a problem in general. But then you add on cannabis, and I think that scares some of the tech candidates away. So I'd love to hear how you've built out that tech team. The question is, how do you build out a tech team when some of the tech candidates are scared off by cannabis? It's like a caper flick, right? You gotta go from scene to scene. I would say no. talk about mission, Larry. Like one of the things that we do above all at our company is we uh, created a set of core values that are important to us and how we operate as a business. And we leverage that every single time we're hiring, right? So we, we push out our core values everywhere and we're, we talk about them as often as we can and we interview against them and we just sort of embrace <laughs> this, you know, we have a mission as a company, we care deeply about it. And yes, of course, we wanna make money for our shareholders and everything like that that comes with running a business, but like at the heart of it, the why we do it is just as important and how we operate often falls in canon to the why we do it. And like, you're gonna find people, I mean, there's a room full of people here who are interested in the cannabis industry, right? And we're in the Bay Area, so presumably some of these people may be looking for jobs. Uh, if you're looking for a job, it seems well, like somebody's she, No, hiring. she's looking for <laughs> tech, engineers. Tech, yeah, well, yeah. if you're an engineer in the room, <laughs> you're looking for a job, right? Uh, but like, I know people in South Bay who would totally work Yeah, there. yeah, it's like, people are gonna be passionate about packaging. People you need to party more at the, right, at the right parties. <laughs> uh, but, but talk about the, the why you're doing it, because the more often that you talk about the why and not just like, hey, we're hiring, and it's, hard to compete on salary in the Bay Area because everybody's paying you know, $120,000 for a new entry engineer. Um, like Instead of talking about things that are hard for engineers to be attracted to, 
if you're only selling what are you doing and why are you doing it and how do we operate as a company and you're selling yourself frankly as like the founder right and then I'm gonna be as a candidate really attracted to wow that's really interesting maybe I wasn't super passionate about packaging but I love cannabis and so we can find a way to work together or I'm really passionate about both of those things and you'll get those people so are you a solo um, entrepreneur Yeah, so that's one of the that's things that, recruiting. yeah, that's one of the things that is actually um, difficult, solo entrepreneurs, it's not actually about cannabis, it's solo entrepreneurs, you have a difficult time attracting teams. Um, so if you can find a co-founder who is, you know, are, I don't know if you're the technical person or you're looking for a technical person to be the co-founder, um, I think that you will have an easier time pulling in engineers because a lot of times um, once you have a technical founder, um, they actually have teams that they've worked with before that just love working with them. And so that's what I did. I actually went out and found my extremely well-seasoned, hardened, like old school IBMer who designed, you know, anti-money laundering software for the FBI and the Department of Defense um, and designed transaction systems for, for, you know, Wells Fargo and Bank of America. And he was, you know, hanging out at fintechs, uh, fintech meetups and things like that. And so um, in the Bay Area, meetups can be a powerful tool for you actually to find um, people who have those, those core interests. And, you know, almost everybody in the Bay has fantastic chops in terms of like engineering and computer science. So going to those places and having a co-founder with you so that they see that it's not just you. So it doesn't feel like they're taking as much of a... a um, so you may have to go to that party to meet the co-founder though. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I did. Just advocating that's exactly more parties what I did. what you're trying to and do. And, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's, again, like you say, the passion has to be there. The, the underlying story for why you're doing this has to be there. It has to be really important and you, you need to be talking about um, grander vision. Um, but it's one of those things that's, that is much easier for people to get around when they start seeing multiple people that are on your yeah. team. So they're like, oh, this is real. Yeah. I hate to person. cut you guys it's off, but we are over and out of time. I'm so sorry. One, two, three. Tech sorry. and cannabis! Tech and cannabis! <laughs>